off by welcoming everybody to this, uh, this call. It's going to be a very interactive session. Uh, we've done uh, five of these before, and each time uh, we've had really good discussions and a lot of, uh, a lot of great uh, material is being, is being shared. Uh, we're lucky today to have two fabulous guests who I'll int introduce in a second. And we're talking about a very important topic. The topic is, what can companies do to manage your supply chains in an environment where we have a pandemic? And in fact, an environment where uh, many of the world's businesses have been shut down at least part of the time, or at least partially. An environment where employees and customers are in some cases unable to buy what we sell, and in other cases buying more than what we've ever seen them buy before. Uh, so it's a, a, a almost a chaotic environment where demand is difficult to predict, and therefore supply chains are difficult to manage. So today's session is going to be all about what lessons can we learn from what's happening from uh, major companies in China and in India, uh, two places that are critical to the supply chain of so many companies around the world. Uh, so my name is George Bailey. I'm the uh, uh, director of the Digital Supply Chain Institute. We're a not-for-profit based in New York. We look forward at supply chains and help companies decide what to do to get ready to prepare and to execute against uh, the digital supply chain vision. Uh, we are going to have a one-hour session today. Uh, so I say good evening to the people in Asia uh, and uh, good evening to the people in, in, in Europe. And good morning to the people who are in California or uh, elsewhere where it's, uh, it's much earlier than, uh, uh, than probably they'd like it to be. So our objectives are three things. The first thing is we want to make sure that we really outline the total coronavirus impact on supply chains, especially China and India. And what can we expect to see next? We're looking forward, uh, not back. So outline those things. Number two, our objective is to describe very specific actions being taken to, uh, for any company that has a presence in Asia, especially a supply chain presence. And so many companies around the world, of course, do have a major supply chain uh, uh, situations that occur in both China and Asia. And finally, develop. We want to develop recommendations uh, that will help you and your supply chains perform even better as, as we go forward with, with the pandemic. And in fact, the pandemic is a, is, a, is a critical issue, but the lessons we're learning now will help us build agile, flexible, effective supply chains that can withstand other issues that may come up. It may not be a pandemic, it may be something else, but there will be disruptions in our supply chain, and we need to know how to manage those in order to be most successful. Uh, next slide, please. So here's, here's our agenda. Uh, I'm starting off right now. Uh, we're going to just give you a quick overview. Uh, following me, I'm lucky enough to have uh, Kurt Ferguson. Kurt is the president uh, for Coca-Cola of uh, Greater China, Korea, and Mongolia. And uh, he's got an amazing discussion going about what it takes to be successful with coronavirus, uh, with your customers, and with your supply chain. And it's uh, uh, some really great insights. So you'll really enjoy hearing about that. Uh, and I'm also lucky enough to have um, a company called Siena, which is, you know, of course, a world famous telecom company. And Rajesh is going to, who's the chairman and president of Siena India, will give us an overview of what they're doing. And it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff with really great thoughts about how to be successful, uh, meet demand, and uh, continue to grow and, and prosper. So we're going to do that very quickly. I'm going to take less than 10 minutes. Uh, Kurt and Rajesh will also. Uh, manage your time to, uh, to about 10 minutes, and we'll then have a Q&A session. And I want to just emphasize here, the most important thing about these Zooms is the interaction. So please, as you're listening to what Rajesh and Kurt say, please prepare your questions, pre-prepare your comments. We really want to hear from you. What makes these meetings so great is the interchange back and forth. So there's a couple ways to uh, make your, your uh, discussion known. One is there's a little uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Click on that and anytime during the presentations or discussion, feel free to uh, uh, put in Q's and A's. We, we will uh, we'll come back and answer most of them, I hope, uh, or at least many of them, uh, but we will um, for sure uh, have a chance to uh, uh, come back to you afterwards if we need to with a, a more detailed discussion of, uh, uh, of what the answers are to your question. So you'll, you'll get answers either right on the line right now or you'll get them after we have our, our discussion. 
So that would be the, uh, that would be the, inter the interaction with the Q&A button. You also have a chat button. You can click on that and uh, share your chat. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We want to have a discussion. And that's what makes this, uh, these sessions so, uh, so interesting and useful. It's the interchange and your ideas. Uh, and we'll make sure that we get done by uh, 10 a.m. New York time. So we're going to take exactly one hour. We will not go over. And uh, uh, we'll respect your time. And, uh, and thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here, here's a, a, some comments from the Digital Supply Chain Institute. And it's really uh, uh, just things if you look across industries, uh, that companies are really struggling in order to find the right model, in order to survive, and then also thrive, uh, not only now, but as they go through the future. Um, for some companies, demand has actually collapsed. Uh, and uh, it, there's companies, many companies have cash flow issues, and it's a real challenge because they can't predict and understand customer demand. And in fact, it's fallen off quite a lot. And on the other hand, there are some companies where demand has uh, dramatically increased. Uh, if you think back to our last session we did here, uh, we had a company that is one of the largest, world's largest uh, grocery store companies. Uh, they supply gro food to grocery stores and they, their demand has gone up quite a lot. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, difficult to understand demand right now. Uh, we don't know how long the peaks in demand will, will occur. We don't know how long uh, the, the valleys will be here. Uh, it's more unpredictable than ever. Uh, and the discussion about what will happen next is so, uh, so uncertain. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you had a chance to read the Wall Street Journal uh, today, but the uh, Vice President of the United States of America, Mike Pence, uh, said that uh, essentially there will be no wave two, or that, and it's under control. Uh, but I think as a company, we all need to think carefully about what we should do to prepare for what's gonna happen next. Um, the second point is that Asia continues to be a supply chain center. Uh, for some companies, China has become less of a focal point and people are diversifying some of their supply chain out of China, but it's still gonna be, and, uh, and, and probably will always be an important center for supply chain activity. Uh, some great manufacturing capability and some, uh, some superior uh, productivity levels as well. Um, China and India will both be supply chain critical. Uh, you know, India is uh, probably most famous for having outstanding services business that supplies so many things to companies around the world, but also has a strong manufacturing sector as well. Um, in fact, here's a data point about uh, China that we picked up. Uh, there are something like 22 million businesses, uh, almost 90% of the businesses within China, um, that are within the area that's impacted by COVID-19. So it's, it's, it's an area that's definitely affected. Um, and that impacts at least 56,000 companies around the world with suppliers either directly or indirectly in their first or second tier. So it's, uh, this is an issue that's ri rippling through the supply chains of so many companies and impacting both demand as well as supply because suppliers in many cases cannot provide uh, what's needed. Uh, and it's ramping back up in China, although there has been quite a large uh, pushback with some problems uh, that Kurt will probably talk about um, in, uh, in Beijing. So countries are coming out of lockdown. Uh, the USA is on a path to uh, open up and most and all states are, are going through that process now. Um, and in some cases, some, some places are going back to lockdown. There's, there's serious issues in Brazil. Uh, China has uh, just implemented this week, some uh, closures of uh, some flights and some things about uh, the infection spreading. Um, and the, th the point I'll make is we really, as, a, as a set of business leaders, we really must do a better job of preparing for wave two than we did for wave one, which was uh, unexpected and took all of us by surprise. Uh, but wave two, uh, we don't know how big it's gonna be. We don't know where it will hit, but uh, it could be significant and we need to have our plans in place to cope with it. Uh, and the final point I'll make on this page is never waste a good crisis. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that almost all companies have told us is that they are now moving much more quickly to execute against the true digital supply chain um, in order to be able to survive uh, issues in the future, in order to be able to improve, improve productivity. The rate of change to online models, uh, the rate of change to uh, digital uh, digital technology that allows you to make things work without human intervention in some cases. Uh, the, the level of change that's happened just over the past three months has been truly astounding. And I think this is gonna continue as companies prepare even more for the, for the future. Next slide, please. 
So um, here's four quick things that uh, we think all companies should be doing to develop a full on plan for wave two. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the vice president of the United States thinks this may not be as big an issue as it could be, but uh, we need to have plans ready for this. Uh, I'm not so confident that the vice president is correct on the wave two. I hope he's right, uh, but we have to be, be sure that we know how to deal with disruptions in the future. Uh, companies need to reduce their costs to uh, preserve their cash flow. And uh, if, if they do things right, they keep their supply chain alive and they're actually gaining market share. Uh, it's very important to identify and actually quantify risks both now and in the future and also opportunities because there's a chance for companies to really step up and gain market share and become market leaders as they serve their customers better than others. Uh, and the final point, I think companies today need to develop a new supply chain strategy uh, that really exploits the power of the digital world and understands the new customer. Because one thing is for sure, the customers that we have today, the things they demand, both on the consumer side as well as on the B2B side, are far different than they used to be. Uh, and and th even than they used to be three years ago. So we make sure that our supply chains meet that new customer and their demands for instantaneous fulfillment and uh, peer review of products and all the things that new customers want. We have those things nailed down in our supply chain so that we can not only do a better job of managing cost, we can also increase revenue and gain market share and, and serve our customers better. Okay, so I, I hope Kurt is on the line. Uh, and if he is, I'm gonna turn this over to you, Kurt, and uh, allow you to, uh, to speak up. And just everybody remember, if you have questions or comments, use the Q&A key, uh, use the chat button, and, and let's make sure we know what, uh, what your issues are as we, as we go forward. So thank you very much. And Kurt, can you, uh, can you take over? Uh, we're good, George, thanks. Uh, VPN willing. Uh, right now, uh, I think the Chinese government, uh, as soon as you put up uh, COVID anything, they, uh, they, they want to read it first. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. So Vivek, if we could go to that, uh, the first uh, the slide number two, right? So we could, sh I think Vivek is sharing it. Yeah, here we go. Good. Um, we either got really lucky in China or really unlucky that the COVID crisis came in uh, the middle of their Thanksgiving and, and uh, Christmas at the same time. Uh, one, we had, uh, we had adequate stocks in the marketplace. Uh, it actually spared the major cities because uh, anybody who's been to China during Chinese New Year that, uh, you know, you could, you could play a game of chess out in the middle of the business intersection uh right during that holiday and and because everybody's gone home they've all gone back to the countryside there's something like 600 million people that travel during during that time period it's it's quite phenomenal but it actually saved the major cities and we'll address beijing a little later but uh so shanghai was virtually empty beijing was virtually empty the downside was some of the smaller provincial cities, and I say smaller, Wuhan, the Wuhan area has got 11 million people. They were packed, and uh, and that unfortunately uh, created, um, you know, a, a more of a crisis because of more, you know, more dense household people eating out. Uh, when the when the virus did spread there, it was quite uh, it was quite substantial. You know, I, I had a good friend that was uh, locked down there from Indiana University. He was visiting his family. And I said, what was the big point when you knew you were going to make it? Uh, he goes, well, what was getting so bad is when they saw that there was, they brought in uh, medical personnel from outside the country to come in and, and help tend to the crisis. Because the first people that always gets hit on this is always the, the first responders, right? It, it, it tears through that wave. And uh, that's probably one of those unexpected things you don't plan for. And he goes, when we saw they were bringing in doctors from Shanghai and around the country, we, we felt good. That way we knew they just weren't going to bomb us <laughs> and, uh, and, and forget about us. Uh, you know, he's been a little facetious, but... Um, but uh, but he's but uh, you know that's how that's how scary it was. The good news is that they locked it down very well. The bad news on a supply chain basis, and uh, I, you can get away with this. Imagine if a truck driver from Ohio couldn't drive to Michigan, so they locked everything down on a province level. And when you have a just-in-time supply chain, as we have across our forty-seven factories. If you couldn't go from one province to another because of your license, not whether you're infected or not, 
was 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 really quite incredible. So we had to put all sorts of contingencies, overlaying, whatever. And obviously, what's going to happen during that, and actually the online retailers helped us with that, is that the whole tail end of our supply chain instantly dropped off, and we instantly got more efficient. Can we go to the to the next slide? We won't. I won't spend a lot of time on uh, the, the supply chain and how we go, and you guys can look at that. And this the people that actually make things in factories, and except you understand all the inputs and outputs. And just roughly speaking, we do about three million, uh, three billion physical cases in China, uh, which is that's that's a case of roughly twenty four. So two 12 packs for the American audience. So a big business spread out all over. Obviously, China is not a country. It's a, it's a continent. And, uh, you know, we immediately dusted off kind of what we called our Ebola light protocol, uh, which was triple seven hour shifts, uh, one hour in between total segregation of those shifts. Uh, then that one hour and it was uh, dis uh, disinfectant time. We, we actually moved whole teams around, uh, front office workers, back office workers, uh, that, just to make sure our supply chain was intact and we could produce. Uh, we also dramatically, as I said, we shaved down our SKUs, produced what we had. Uh, also, there was, uh, we, we were fairly lucky. We had a, in place a fairly rigorous uh, personal protection equipment policy of, of what to do. We, we tried to figure out how to extend that a little bit. It also made us very popular when you're, when you're sitting on a, a couple million N95 masks, it makes you very popular with the government right away. So we had to figure out uh, how we had to ration all the, all the requests. Uh, but, uh, but that worked pretty well. And we obviously learned a, a lot of lessons on that. Um, you know, uh, we, we kind of started the, we, the social production distancing, but, but it ended up with all phase. We did all sorts of walkthroughs uh, but, okay, where does the person take a break? Where do they eat lunch? How does that go? You know, and we immediately said, wow, we got to close the, the cafeterias. We had to get rid of the chopsticks. We had to go to single use plates. There was a, where were the, who was going to supply the food? How did that look like? How did we have to take care of all the third parties? So that was a very rigorous structure we had to go through. Uh, and, and we had to learn it as, as we went uh, because even the Ebola, uh, uh, protocol we, that we had before didn't really work because in, in Ebola we actually segregated the plants and the people come, couldn't come inside or outside the plant they actually lived in the plant we vowed to take care of everybody's family we didn't think that this warranted that probably in hindsight we probably should have done it at a couple of our factories uh, of actually total segregation and you know pay hazard pay see who wants to volunteer uh, but we didn't we didn't take it that far Okay, next slide. You know, we we think that we're a, a fairly decent marketing company at Coca-Cola, but we're a really, really good uh, distribution company. However, this is changing so much, and it's, it's really uh, why I love being in China. We, you've seen endless... Uh, surveys and studies on what's happening with the retail scene in China. It is, it is virtually, you know, we're really happy. We delivered about 12 million outlets in a given week. That sounds like a lot. That's great. But I have 1.4 billion outlets, which is called a smartphone. Um, people expect just in time. Uh, there was a massive disruption during this period. Um, and it, 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 Did he lose Kurt, George? Hey, uh, Kurt, we uh, we lost your your audio. Can can you hear us okay? Uh, let me let me uh, send Kurt a text. I'm not just to see what happened. Uh, as he mentioned, it's uh, there may be some interference here. Let me just. Sorry, everyone, for this. It's uh, we it's. Uh, Kurt must have an issue with connectivity where he is. Let me let me try this again. Hey Kurt, uh, can you hear us? 
Well, he's not, he's not connecting me with, with chat or audio. So uh, it might be that we should switch to uh, Sienna and, uh, and come back to Kurt when he gets connected again. But sure. Is that okay with, with you, Rajesh? Absolutely. So, yeah. Please, uh, please take over. And I, I know that uh, you're the expert on this. So uh, please give us all your wisdom. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for having me, uh, George and Sean and the rest of the team. Um, look, I would have loved to hear the rest of the story uh, from Kurt as well. But uh, look, I mean, I think uh, let's start with this India story. And then as, as, uh, as George, uh, you know, very kindly introduced me and, and Sienna's business. I think we are into network systems, network um, strategy. Um, if, you, if you move to the next chart, um, uh, Vivek, if you could, uh, do you have my first chart on? Okay, great. Um, so we're going to talk roughly about uh, what, what really happened uh, uh, in India uh, very briefly before we get into the supply chain details. Um, look, I mean, with like every other country, and then, you know, Kurt talked about uh, China. China was a little different from the rest of the country, but you've been seeing uh, the impact of that in the United States uh, and some of you in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, India certainly was no exception, uh, you know, but the, the, the balance which India had to walk between life and livelihood was a little more acute than some of the other countries. And, you know, we had some, um, you know, most, one of the probably world's most stringent and most, the largest stringent um, lockdown ever. I mean, you know, uh, you know locking down 1.3 uh, billion population at home uh, 70 days in a row wasn't a, wasn't a very easy task for our government to do. And then they did that. Um, is, is the right thing or not? As uh, time will tell us. But, uh, but that is what it is. And so, you know, we, we finished those 70 days strict lockdown and we are now into this unlock mode of saying that, you know, how do you sort of open, open up things one by one? That's the mode we are in. And if you look at those charts there and then if you just compare with India and then the worldwide numbers, um, you know, I think uh, well, what, we don't know the reason, but I think India has done fairly uh, you know, well in terms of the, the, the life side of the equation or, or, the, or the healthcare side of the equation. Uh, we haven't, uh, we read to, uh, I'll talk about the livelihood side of the equation, the economy wise, I think you've done a, we, we will end up in a, in a, in a much uh, a poorer uh, location. But, uh, but if you look at the, the life side of the equation, I think, uh, you know, it, as of now, you know, our, our death toll has been still uh, probably around 12,000 people or so, for around 1.3 billion people uh, with, um, with about 300 and, uh, you know, 50,000 plus uh, cases. Um, it is not too bad. And a death per million, as one of the counts, which uh, which uh, uh, which is widely um, calculated, we are at about a nine, and we were we used to be at one and two, etc. But now we are about a nine, where the average is about sixty. Um, if you want to look at this number for a for a country like, for example, Spain or or um, uh, France, it will be around six hundred and fifty or so that number. So so uh, for the U.S., I think it's probably again about a uh, hundred or so. Um, so that, that's a, that's a pretty uh, decent number, um, and. Um, I think George, you mentioned it as I said. You know, uh, you know, the impact on the industries have been sort of twofold. Uh, there have been industry for, for which we had a very net positive impact, uh, um, and then there are some industries which had a net negative impact. And and one would think that um, uh, you know, luckily, you know, this is not because of anything else the industries have done. Because of the situation, I think uh, when you look at the IT and telecom, etc., I think they fell into the broadly around the net positive impact. And if you do the things right, you will probably end up having more business and more. Um, opportunities for you to, uh, you know, go and maybe even a, a, on a growth trajectory compared to anything else. Um, um, so, so uh, when you look at the uh, the reason why uh, telecom, if if you move to the next chart, Vivek, if you move, to, if you understand uh, the way it, uh, you know telecom and, and our industry works, you know, connectivity is becoming so so critical, and everything is actually going into hyper cloud mode, and 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 uh, you know that is actually driving a lot of our business. Um, which means that you know whether it is the telcos or the what we call web scalers or the OTT providers and you know entertainment providers and all of them, um, I think there is a, a increased need for people to be digitally connected than ever before, and so and and hence uh, you know our industry is positioned well. And we're not. I, I don't want to uh, sit here and say that uh, you know we're going to um, you know have a. a a great business for the for the rest of the life, right? I mean, so if, yes, for the this and last couple of quarters is fantastic. I think we're going to have same thing for the next quarter or so. But and if things don't get back, and you know, if the, the broader economy is going to have a, uh, a you know go go south, and I think there is we are not immune to any of those um, you know bigger bigger issues which will happen in the economy anyway. 
Uh, but I think uh, the, the way that we had built our business and then the way we had diversified, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, it all helped pretty much uh, in terms of how our, you know, our competition in this, was in the same industry has been suffering a little more than what we are doing. So I think that's good news in terms of how we've been running the company, how we've been able to, uh, you know, broad base our, uh, not just our customer base, but it's also the industries, the, the type of customers, as well as the supply chain in many ways. And I'll, I will talk about that in a little more in detail. Um, obviously, like everybody else, we had closed down our offices, uh, the, the, the onset of all of this, um, and we don't have our uh, employees going into work. They've been able to work uh, very, very uh, well from home because we've been doing the work from home thing, uh, you know, pretty, pretty much even before. Uh, so our IT, uh, the investment on IT and what we've been able to do, I mean, 100% of our employee base and our contractor base, we provide them high-end um, laptops and everything else. So they're very mobile in, in, by definition. Um, all our technologies on cloud, we are a 100% cloud company. So all of that has helped significantly for us to uh, get back into, into action, even though we do not have access to office on a regular basis. We do need a few of our people going into the offices because uh, for them to uh, make sure that our labs are operational so that our, the rest of the folks from, from home can work. Um, so that's a, that's a small contingent who has to be in the office. But otherwise, I think we've been pretty okay with, uh, with the remote working. As a company, I think we've been very, very uh, thoughtful of uh, how do we support our people at the time of the need, uh, whether it is uh, you know providing them with you know, leaves and and work from home and uh, you know facilitation uh, in terms of making sure that they they have uh, set up a home office and we've gone out of our way to not only pay them um, enough money for them to uh, um, you know set up a home office, but we also uh, you know sending our own office chairs and monitors and display devices everything to their home so that. They're absolutely uh, able to do their job well. As you know, in India, um, most people ne may not necessarily have a home office, so it's important for us to sort of support them so that they can balance their families and 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 work as well. Uh, and same with the communities. I think we've been able to do a, a decent job of um, supporting um, a lot of uh, uh, the the COVID nineteen um, charities, and then you know uh, we've also been uh, doing what is called a, a, a triple X maxing. Uh, you know, a matching program, which means if our employee gives X amount of dollars, we are actually doing 3X in the company. So it's really a, a very generous uh, match uh, in terms of making sure that we are able to reach out to a much broader population overall. If you move on to the next slide, um, Vivek, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what is our um, supply chains, uh, drivers of uh, transformation that we've been running. I and mean, this is not necessarily the, 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 uh, only for the COVID, but, but even otherwise. When we look at our supply chain, and I think these are the fundamental drivers which actually drives some of the changes that we've been able to put in place over the last few years. And, and in, again, as, as all of us know, the key is to sort of do some of this before it hits you rather than waiting for it to sort of really hit you and then manage these changes. So I think this has been ongoing for the last, I would say about three or four years. Um, firstly around, uh, you know, we as a company were really growing through the roof, right, as I say. Uh, you know, we had a fortune. We were fortunate to to have a very very healthy growth um, over the last four or five years. Um, our customer base has grown truly global. So all of that, um, you know, has has given a, a, a one of the significant drivers for us to how do we really look at our supply chain very differently. The second driver was around the market dynamics have been changing with the with the trade issues between India and China, uh, with the with the U.S. and China. We are a U.S. based organization, so within U.S. and China. Uh, whether it is the the COVID situation, which actually started uh, recently, all of that uh, actually is a big impact for us, and we have a, a separate track running around market dynamics and global threats, and how do, how does it really affect your supply chain, and what do you have to do for it? The third element or third driver of that would be around you know a customer experience itself. I think you know we don't often relate the supply chain efficiency with the with the, at the end customer experience, but we do it very strongly. Not only our sales interactions and the services interaction, but we also pull it all the way to the supply chain and make sure that if you have the supply chain, uh, uh, you know, you can cut down the lead time and, and ensure that our customers are uh, much more, uh, have a better experience with, the, uh, with, with what they buy from us as opposed to just the uh, supply chain as a, as a sort of a background or a, or a background activity, right? And of course, uh, the fact that we've been selling different products over the period of time we've introduced lots of new products over the recent times and then all of them would require a completely different type of supply chain which is which is very very interesting that you know each of these uh, new products actually have a 
a, a, a totally different kind of a positioning in the market. So we need to have a different uh, um, strategy around some of them. Um, same thing with uh, with uh, uh, you know our CFO wants better uh, better margin. Obviously, as everybody wants better, better margins. And then you know there's also competitive pressure as to how do you really do uh, your, your supply chain better. So that is another driver. And the last one I want to talk about is our expanding customer requirements. Not because we so we used to serve predominantly the telcos at one point in time, but today our, our telco based business is uh, about half of what we do, but a little over over half. The remaining ones have actually moved on to the web scalers, people who provide connectivity even otherwise, people who provide um, OTTs, which are um, you know on the top uh, providers. So all of these web scalers and the cloud providers, you know, as you know, we support all of them uh, from a connectivity point of view. And that uh, has been a very, very new expectation, new experience, new expectation, new experience that they need to have. So that's a, a huge uh, uh, need as well. So what, how do we manage all of that? If you move to the next slide, uh, you know, these are some of the drivers that we, we believe that will actually get us there, right? You know, the first one is around, um, you know, how do you make sure that you have a, a safety stock? Uh, this is like a vendor managed inventory uh, and at a really at a finished goods level. So what do you see in this chart is different elements of how we make sure that our supply chain is uh, you know, resilient. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you need to summarize this, this is basically uh, volatility management, right? whether it is the forecast volatility or demand volatility uh, or supply volatility or market volatility, whatever it is, I think, you know, how do you really manage it as a company? Uh, and you know, by, by ensuring that you do have the the right level of uh, you know uh, actions that you take around or across these dimensions. I'll go through very quickly. The second one is around buffer stock, and then of course dry banking. Most of you know what it is. I think we believe that uh, you know with our component suppliers, we've had some some very good experience in terms of making sure that they've been able to help with us uh, and, and work with us in terms of making sure that um, we we have we don't run into those issues. Um, second sourcing in our in our um, bleeding edge of technology, we are always in the our technology that we, uh, some of the cutting edge technology that we develop are uh, only about a year old or sometimes uh, maybe a, a two years old. So you don't really have a lots of sourcing options there, right? So, so sometimes it's not even possible for us to have a second source, but, but we do make sure that, uh, you know, we, we manage that very well. Um, and also through the, through, the, through the whole component distribution, I think we've been able to get ahead of that. Uh, geographically, we need to be diversified in terms of where do we source our, our uh, materials and where do we build some of these materials. Because we don't do any in-house manufacturing in large scale. Most of it is actually contract manufacturing. So we do rely on um, our uh, contract manufacturers who are by themselves global in many ways, right? So they need to be global because for example, let's say we have a contract manufacturer who's helping us from Mexico. And if something happens to Mexico, uh, instead of we trying to ship that to another supplier in, in Thailand, for instance, we want uh, somebody who has got a facility in both Mexico and Thailand uh, so that they can, you know, we don't have to ship the vendor, but they, they ship the manufacturing into a, into a totally different, uh, different site. You still have some, some downtime, but then it will be much, much lower than what it would be if you had to sort of enroll a new uh, supplier all over again. So, and then last but not the least is that we do a significant level of uh, monitoring and then tracking um, how our suppliers really perform. Uh, to make sure that we are able to match it with what the, the broader customer requirements are going to be there. Um, if you move to the, uh, probably my last slide there. Yeah, so so this is my last slide. So basically, uh, you know, when you look at the COVID learnings um, uh, around, uh, you know, if there were one thing which we, we believe that we did fairly well, and I think it is such an important thing that we've been able to pay attention to, not that we, any of us knew that there was, there was going to be a pandemic like this, but uh, the, the investments and then focus around systems, tools, the overall digital strategy that we put around our supply chain, making sure that we use that big data, we generate tons of data, right? And, and by the way, this is a fairly large supply. We have, I think 11,000 tons of uh, material that we ship. We have 150,000 products that we go through some of this. So it's a fairly large uh, supply chain that we are talking about, right? So ensuring that the big data is, is leveraged and making sure that we do have a a broad digital strategy actually helped us quite a bit. Uh, I believe that uh, you know we had a, a very good IT platform, as I mentioned before, um, even for our, our business. I think so. That has actually um, you know really uh, helped us in, 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 the, in, the, in the need in the uh, in our effort to um, you know uh, outlive the the COVID nineteen issues. Um, you know, uh, and then also some of the other stuff that we did with people. For example, our uh, 
uh, our partners and then the legal department, etc., has been very effective working with the embassies around the world to make sure that we were able to manage uh, multiple situations. So look, when we started, we didn't. We thought we had zero. We have nothing coming directly from China to us. Right? We have no direct. Uh, you know, China, you know, when the, when the whole uh, discussion was around saying that, um, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a China virus and all of that, um, you know, but but turns out that, you know, we have uh, second level and third level suppliers, so of course, uh, I have a, a big dependency on on, uh, on China. So in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, look, um, broadly, we believe that, uh, you know, as long as we can design our supply chain for the future, we can go through the details if need be on the Q&A. Um, you know, how do you make sure that you're able to transform uh, our supply chain over a period of time, truly taking a global view, whether, uh, you know, irrespective of where your suppliers and contract manufacturers are based. And of course, focus all this around our customer satisfaction, it's the, the broader strategy, which is going to get you to where you want to go. So with that, let me turn it over back to George. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was great. Very, very interesting. And I, I don't, I don't know if Kurt can hear us. Uh, Kurt, are you on the line still? Uh, I am. I got back on. I'm, I have a cell phone going now, and uh, my U.S. cell phone and uh, the iPad's actually working again. So VPN's right. up and running. Good. Good. Well, I think we'll go right to Q and A. Uh, and you know, people have a lot of questions about all these all this material. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through a few questions and 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 tee these tee these questions up and see see what both of you think. Um, who? So the first. Well, here's a here's a question for you, Kurt. It says. Uh, in light of shelter in place and working from home, how is Coca-Cola dealing with uh, the new workplace in the future? Are you going to change your real estate strategy? What, what's, what's the story as you look forward about um, the way you're going to handle things given uh, the changes that you've seen just from this COVID experience? Yeah, um, we're probably going to, you know, obviously what we're doing with back office, uh, the more we can, uh, we will move that two homes. Uh, the problem is uh, very similar to what we encountered in, in, in India, uh, is that um, the homes aren't designed for having a lot of space for offices. And, and I, I still remember uh, we, our, our female associates were so happy and we're, we're predominantly uh, almost 60% of our workforce is female at the head office. Uh, they were so happy to, to get back in the office because they said, you know, they were they were like triple hatting, uh, doing a bunch of different jobs from uh, from class tutor to uh, you know chief meal preparer and uh, and also trying to get the work out. But uh, but we are going to look at that. That's obviously on the agenda. The problem is we have 47 big physical plants with 23 additional juice plants. Those you can't, you know, those you have to keep running. And uh, we got to something that, you know, we have a, on the case of something like 27,000 trucks we put on the street every day. So our footprint's so big, it's, it's not going to be, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's something that we, we got to manage through. But there isn't a lot of things we can do there in the new reality. However, what is changing is, is how we go to market um, and how we do that. It's uh, the consumers changed quite dramatically. Uh, and this is our biggest learning out of this. And each time it ratchets up, whether it's SARS or MERS or, or whatever. And this time uh, people are going to work. Uh, that's loud in most places, but they're not going out. And home sweet home, the new cocoon is, uh, is where it is. So we have to figure out a lot of new ways how to deliver to those areas. One of the ones we do is mini cans, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a guiltless pleasure and something else that you can share with the whole family. It's under 100 calories, uh, you know, so that's a product that uh, we're up 300% on. So it, we, we're, we have to rework our whole supply chain from the consumer backwards is, is quite frankly the, but we're still going to have to have big physical footprints. That's just how we do it and with our scale. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think companies around the world are looking at exactly the issue that, that you're on, which is how do you decide what you have to do physically? And what can you do uh, remotely where there is less uh, risk of infection and so forth? I think I think your thoughts about that are are, are really uh, are really super super helpful. Um, we have a bunch of Q and A um, that have come up. Um, there, there's a, here's one question, and I'm not sure what what the answer will be, but I'll ask both of you. How could African countries learn from both Chinese and Indian experiences? What what can uh, what can you do to avoid not suffer wave two and food shortage and, and so forth? So it's a question from one of our Africa-based colleagues. Could 
uh, I don't know who wants to answer it, but what, what do you think? And maybe, maybe Rajesh, you can talk to this, which, uh, um, how, what, what can you say to help the, our, our colleagues in Africa? So one of the things that I talked about uh, India's uh, response to this and, you know, with this whole lockdown, I don't know whether our government had uh, expectation uh, on, on what actually followed with, with the lockdown. Uh, we had um, a significant amount of migrant workers who were working in the cities. The moment the lockdown happened, um, you know, nobody expected that all of them will start to, uh, because there were no transportation or, or any of that was uh, during the lockdown, it was a very strict lockdown. They started walking back um, to their uh, to the villages where they came from. So that wasn't a very, um, very uh, you know, uh, it wasn't expected at all by anybody. And that actually caused us more problem than uh, than solution of the lockdown itself. The whole lockdown was for you to sort of make sure that you're not moving anywhere, you're not, uh, you know, um, doing anything. But then this was actually very counterintuitive in many ways. Luckily, uh, you know, that by itself did not cause too much of uh, infection. But then it, it did cause a lot of trouble for the for the, for the workers. So I think you know, uh, in, you know, in it's very 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 similar uh, uh, type of situation in some of the African countries. I think it'll be a great uh, way to make sure that. Um, we focus the uh, strategy around the bottom of the pyramid uh, and then work the way backwards as uh, coming in with the solution which will uh, uh, appear uh, good for uh, maybe the, the top 10% or 20% of the population, but the bottom of the pyramid is what gets affected. So who is really the most affected in India because of the lockdown? It isn't uh, me or you or any of us at the call or even uh, most of the people who are salaried who are actually get their, uh, their salary these are the, the people who really got completely uh, uh, taken aback uh, is the, the daily wages earners. The people who are on the, uh, on the street in vending carts who are actually selling something to make sure that they're making a living out of that. So those, that population is so important. And uh, I believe that uh, we, as a country, we were actually caught a little bit off guard with that. And that may be a great learning for a country like Africa that, you know, that is the population that you need to be foremost be careful about because they, they are the most vulnerable in my mind. Yeah, good point. Very, very good point. I, George, if I, if I could jump in on that one, I spent 20 years of my career in Africa. And the thing we learned really fast in the Ebola countries is education of the families. Uh, you spend a lot of time on your workers. You give personal protection gear to the workers. We actually gave masks to the families. We showed them how to use bleach. We actually organized food distribution because a lot of times, uh, a lot of time in Africa, a lot of a lot of time and effort and marketplaces are crowded. We delivered rice and food essentials to all of our workers because we figured that was one of our weakest links uh, where the transmission was going to be because it took a little while to close schools, took a little while for the doctors. So we actually encouraged our doctors to to reach out if somebody was ill to go to the plant doctor who had the proper gear on. Uh, and and the education of the family was uh, was very critical that uh, to, to eliminate the spread. Obviously, we want to keep everybody healthy as much as possible. But uh, but if he, if they go in home to an environment that that isn't healthy because people haven't practiced social distancing, etc., then all everything we've done inside our four walls is for naught. Yep. Yep. Very 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 true. Uh, I've got a, a bunch of other questions. One of the questions here. Kurt, is another one for you. It's about, uh, you know, what happened with respect to your supply chain? And uh, uh, you, you, obviously the, the whole issue with, uh, uh, with, with this crisis was not foreseen, that then it happened. Did you find that uh, you, were, you were out of stock of certain SKUs? Did you find that there's a, ch a change in what people ordered? Um, how did you, were you out of stock in, in, in some areas, but not in others? Explain how, how you're able to meet the demand that happened uh, after the crisis occurred? We, first of all, it's always good to be really lucky. And so we were heading into Chinese New Year. So we had huge stocks of almost everything, expecting a sell through and then people just didn't go to the stores. So we, we were lucky on that. So that's, that's the honest answer. Uh, but then quickly, it, it doesn't take long for that to dissipate. Uh, and we just chopped down our SKUs. We made conscious choices that we were going to be out of stock. Uh, a couple of the newer brands, we said we can't, we, we just started these, uh, we got to keep this in place. But uh, also when everything shifted to online uh, and uh, in, in the whole e-commerce and, and delivery, uh, they, they, that, that supply chain, that last mile pretty much does it for you. Uh, they only want fast moving, high velocity items 
And so they're not worried about the oolong uh, uh, natural tea uh, that, uh, that is a premium price. They want a Coke, they want a Coke Zero, they want something that's going to move fast and, and, and not clog up their supply chain because overnight their business in some cases doubles. Um, the mm -hmm. online business, just for somebody you know like Walmart, uh, went up to almost 300%. And a lot of that's going to stick. Uh, the McKenzie study says, you know, five, maybe 10 points of that's going to stick. So it's a dramatic, dramatic model what's happening right now. Yeah, I think but I we've made. We made conscious choices and we actually went back to the old time circle on the map. Where could we deliver to? What could we deliver to? And then where could we use our online, our online uh, partners and distributors to, to pick up the slack into certain areas? Yeah, I think that those are good points. And I, I think for sure in industries around the world, the move to online uh, is happening fast. So the people are going to be ordering differently, uh, almost everything. Um, here, here's another question for Sienna, a uh, question for Rajesh. Uh, did you have a business continuity plan already in place? Did you have to change it uh, during the lockdown? Have you? Have, what did you do to modify your your BCP, if anything, um, as, as you went through this crisis? Sure. Um, so traditionally in CNA we had a BCP. Obviously, there was a corporate BCP team broadly, uh, and the BCP was structured around the functional areas only. That means, you know, uh, like supply chain as a, as a discipline will have a BCP plan, uh, a financial accounting will have a BCP, a BCP plan, uh, and, and so on. So each function had its own BCP, and then that is what made up these, the CNR BCP broadly. Uh, but with the COVID-19, we also realized that you've got to have a location dimension to the BCP as well. For instance, so, so I would chair a BCP team in India, so it would be purely for CNA India, not as only from a corporate function point of view. Will be a sort of a, we developed a matrix system, if you may. The horizontals being the uh, being the locations and the verticals being the functional uh, area. So it is important for us to make sure that we take uh, an India action because you know the same supply chain issues um, uh, you faced in London will be very different from what is faced in Delhi because of the fact that in Delhi it's all locked down, whereas in London is different. So I think we brought in a lot of location specific um, activities into the BCP team. Which is very very uh, effective because, uh, for instance, uh, you know even for a for our essential staff to move around, we needed to get passes and all of that within the uh, within uh, uh, you know in India. So which is a big deal, right? You know we got to really have a, a system and, and and staff to actually apply for it and go negotiate with them and then get those um, you know passes for you to sort of even move even anything you know move our, our, our material from our, to our our labs and so on. So so it was a big deal for us to have that uh, you know, major change in the BCP dimension itself. Um, and then we, we have two levels of BCP now, as I said, you know, the functional level BCP and the corporate BCP, which meets twice a week. Uh, we continue to, uh, we just scale it down to once a week now. And there's also location BCP now we're meeting. We start, we just, from this week onwards, we'll actually start meeting once a week, but we were meeting at least twice a week, sometimes even, even more to make sure that we do have a right level of coordination. Good, good, that's excellent. And you know, I think, uh, uh, one, an, another question that's coming up is, several times is about um, here's a, we have a we're lucky enough to have a professor a very esteemed professor uh, on the call right now who's very famous for his supply chain work uh, uh, Vishal Guar and uh, his question is about has diversification become a bigger priority in supply chains diversification of all kinds diversification in supply customer base products and capacity and also uh, uh, you know how does this affect in people's efforts to go digital. So, and maybe back to you, Kurt. What, the, what, you know, what have you had diversification, supply chain happening? Um, are, are you? Are there, is there a greater push to go digital? What What, what do you see happening for? Well, everything, everything here is is so digitally oriented right now. Other payments or or whatever. We were we were lucky that we could just fit into into that existing structure. And if and if nobody studied, uh, if anything in supply chain, I. I if you haven't studied the, what's happening in China, you need to get on the, well, when you can, get on the plane, right? Uh, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's amazing how it's overlapped. So we were lucky on, on that one. There were so many different areas. What on diversification, what actually hurt us is that, you know, as we premiumized our business going forward, uh, when you start looking at uh, premiumization, a lot of times you only do that in one or two different places because the skill sets are different or whatever. And we had to 
we had, and it sounds kind of strange, but we had to realize we had to standardize our premiumification strategy of, of what we were trying to do with our brands because we just couldn't have one factory producing uh, one thing. And, and, and it, was, it was really amazing how the team came together to try to figure out how to do that. And we actually li relied on a lot of contract packers. We actually tried to get them up and running uh, third parties to try to do some of the things that we were having trouble distributing with. And, and what, happened, uh, what happened in China is fairly unique. They went to total province lockdowns which, as I said before, you couldn't get one truck from one province to another. And sometimes you couldn't even get that guy driving the truck, even though he had a commercial permit. So we had to do a, a lot of shuffling and, and reshuffling of that, and then actually rely on the, a lot of our warehouses, et cetera, to, re, to, to really refocus what we had to do. So it was, uh, it was a constantly moving chessboard. Uh, and, and if we wouldn't have been totally digitized on that, uh, it would have been a, a total absolute nightmare. But uh, fortunately, we could, we could ride on what's already established in China. Yeah, I think, I think could I make two comments? One, uh, uh, for sure, the, the, the rush to be digital is uh, only sped up uh, in, for co companies around the world. Uh, the second thing is, uh, you keep saying you were lucky. I think lucky means you are a good, a good executive making the right things happen. So that's just my opinion, but for sure, uh, for sure being lucky is good, but, but doing the good things uh, to make yourself lucky is even better. I have a question for, back for Rajesh. Uh, does Siena have any secondary or tertiary suppliers in India? And if so, how are they handling, handling labor shortages? Uh, each country's government has different approaches to the pandemic. How did your ERP system help you in production planning? Uh, do you have any BI embedded in the ERP? Uh, can, you, can you talk about, about, about those kind of topics as, uh, as you think about your business? So um, we do not have any secondary or uh, uh, treasury suppliers in India because, as I said before, uh, we don't do any large-scale manufacturing with the company. We outsource them all to the contract manufacturing. Uh, and most of our contract management happens outside of India. Um, you, know, you know, most of the gears that are actually made, um, you know, most of it is actually in uh, Mexico uh, and, and Thailand and a few other uh, locations. So, you know, we don't have anything in, in India. Um, however, we do have a, a phenomenally large um, R&D center in India. And so it's, a, it's a, about a 2,000 people facility. Uh, we built, uh, we designed and, uh, you know, build those products in India, but then the actual manufacturing, large-scale manufacturing happens outside of India. Um, we have not faced any labor shortage even in, in uh, those areas where we are manufacturing, and we've been lucky, as I mentioned before. Um, I think the timing and the way we have diversified, um, to your previous point, diversification of what we did in terms of where we got uh, stuff manufactured, um, you know, and then truly having the, the right balance between what we do um, closer, closer to the, where we need the uh, products, as opposed to how do we, I mean, there is always this the question of, you know, pre previously, uh, it was all about efficiency. I think moving forward, uh, you know, when, when things get, when manufacturing gets, you know, pulling things more close to home, uh, you still have to be efficient, but I think the resiliency uh, and, and then the, uh, the ability for you to sort of make sure that you, you do have uh, your business uh, totally resilient will probably become more important than just being efficient. I, th I think you're absolutely right. This whole focus on resiliency is going to is going to continue uh, and increase. Yeah. Back. So I think I think you're to totally right about that. Hey, I have an, I have another question coming up from uh, Chris Kane. Let's unmute Chris. Chris, could you uh, could you explain your question? Yeah, thanks, George. Uh, Kurt, you had mentioned that you had excess N95 masks uh, on in stock that you were able to then uh, supply to outside of Coke. Is that something that you have? as a standard practice or were you again right back to your lucky versus good were you just lucky to have a good supply of n95 when all of this happened and and how do you plan for that if it is a, a normal part of your uh supply resiliency uh capacity uh yeah good question uh this one we probably weren't lu lucky on unfortunately in this part of the world we have our share of natural disasters right uh, and we've had SARS before, uh, and uh, we've always had those in stock. And and what happened is is that uh, we also handle a lot of things that have uh, powders 
So we have huge stocks of those. And, and we actually, OSHA standards, we, we change out an N95 mask every four hours in, in some of our adverse handling requirements when we're handling powders, sugars, citric acid, things such as that. So um, we always make sure we have what would happen if uh, that would get cut off. Those are one of those essential supplies. So that's what we, we had in stock. And we I mean, they were great barter tools when it, when it came to reopening the plant and also to showing, one, the government that, uh, that we had all the necessary things in place, and, and two, that, uh, you know, they were all saying, can we, can we maybe have, uh, you know, what you have in excess? Uh, so, you know, it was a good civic duty. I would, I would have to say that uh, what they say about the road to hell with the good intentions, uh, I actually secured 1.5 million N95 masks in the U.S. and shipped them over. And uh, absolute feeding frenzy when they hit, to, hit China. Uh, I don't know if... I, it was a good thing, but I don't know if I would do it again. Uh, you have to really think through uh, what happens with all of that. Who wants to grab those masks and then trying to get them to the intended spot. But uh, obviously, we've restocked the masks and tripped a bit. You know, we, we always had a very, uh, on paper, a, a really strong business continuity plan, but we actually started stress testing it and actually would go dark on a couple of our plants just to say, what really happens if there's an earthquake in Sichuan? Because sometimes there's an earthquake in Sichuan, or there's a flood in in Guangzhou, and uh, so we would actually shut down and 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 reimagine what would it take to do that. So a lot of that training and stress testing really came. Uh, you know, it's like if you, you the first time you go camping, you're a miserable failure. The second time you're getting smarter at it, right? So uh, we we tried to get smarter with real live examples, uh, and that really came to the forefront when when this crisis hit. Uh, and the first thing we said also is that let's get some of these masks to the hospitals. We're not going to get anywhere if all the doctors are falling, nurses are falling over. So we we made a couple right calls there. Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you, and tremendous uh, a tremendous opportunity for Coke to assert the societal value of its uh, enterprise and brand. Yeah, you just yeah we we, we uh, yeah that one you, you just got to walk through all the pitfalls of trying to be a mask donor when people see it as a life or death thing because uh, some very strange uh, behaviors uh, occur. But uh, we got to finally all sort it out. Well, that's great. That's great, Kurt. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Rajesh. We're we're going near the end of our hour. Uh, I want to just once again thank both of our uh, speakers. Uh, excellent stories about what's happening in India and in China. Uh, there's a lot more questions, which uh, we will answer. I will uh, make sure we get uh, the slides out to everyone who's on the call so you can have that material to look at. Uh, and I'll make sure that we have answers to the questions that were not answered yet. Uh, there's some great topics that came up uh, and uh, a lot more information. Uh, we could spend another hour on these things. But in any event, thank you very much for your, your super presentation. Rajesh and Kurt, fabulous. And uh, everyone got a great sense of what you're doing and how to prepare for the future. And uh, all, all the companies that heard this are, are going to do an even better job of coping with uh, going forward. So in any event, uh, thanks everybody for joining the, this, uh, this discussion. We appreciate it. We're going to have another discussion much like this uh, in July. We'll announce the date and time uh, in a little bit. But uh, you, right now, we've got it set. You could put it on your calendar right now for uh, July 9th, 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, we have some speakers lined up from South America and Japan as we continue to rotate uh, um, in different parts of the world to look at what's happening. And uh, everyone stay safe and uh, keep the supply chains running. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Thanks, George. Be back. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Be sure.